Good morning. So welcome to central Pennsylvania, where you get up in the morning in the middle of November and you have to put a parka on and by the afternoon you have to wear a pair of shorts. Um, thank you for being here this morning, November 1st. Um, I don't have a slide on this, but uh, I know that we have a couple of people who are on our uh, designer bag bingo. Um, do we have a final tally on that yet? Not yet. How close are we getting? I think maybe around 11,000. Okay. But so it's not final. Not final for those on Zoom. Uh, plus or minus 10 to 11,000 hours. So a very nice job. I know North Point uh, had a lot of people that served on this committee. So thank you for everybody involved. Thank you, anybody who showed up uh, at the event. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, didn't get out of there till fairly late in the in the evening, uh, but it was it was a good time had by all. So thanks uh, all around. Um, let's see, and this never starts off right. Give me a second. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Dan and James, I don't know who is coming up, if you're both coming up. Oh. All right. And I have the mic over here. Go ahead. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, just a couple of things we wanted to go over as far as some uh, promotions or, I guess, market enhancements we have going on um, from now until the end of the year. Anyone closing with a VA loan through home sale mortgage, we're going to issue um, a credit for their appraisal fee. So obviously with Veterans Day coming up next week, it's just kind of a way to uh, to thank our veterans. In addition to that, um, after closing, we're going to send them an American-made American flag uh, as just kind of a, a thank you gift as well. And obviously to honor and thank them for their service to our country. Um, so if you have any um, opportunities for veterans, just something else that we're able to do uh, with the appraisal fee and uh, get them to closing before the end of the year. Thank you. Uh, next thing up, kind of in the same um, sort of spectrum here, but uh, obviously rates are, are a lot higher than they've been, uh, you know, in the last few years. So we're uh, doing a promotion. Any close transactions from today? Today's November 1st, right? Yeah. Uh, today through February 28th. So anybody that closes um, and then when rates go down, we refi them. Uh, We're going to uh, issue a lender credit up to 1% well, one percent of the loan amount capped at $3,000 for them. For anybody that closes in a purchase loan during that time, um, a lender credit to, uh, yeah. Just kind of a thank you for the refi and trying to give them a break, uh, you know, because of the higher interest rates now. So we figure, I think we went over this a couple meetings ago, uh, refinances, maybe $4,500 in, in fees and things like that for uh, for the refi. So a $250,000 loan amount, you know, 2,500 bucks in, in credit they get to, uh, to help with some of those costs. So it's just a nice uh, thank you to them. And Hopefully we uh, get a refi out of it later down the road. So that's always good, uh, but just something to uh, to help. So anybody that uh, is looking to purchase, send them our way and they can be eligible for that. Bob, Bob, just a second. It was on Zoom. A, a question on, on a refi, and you and you, if you anticipate doing that at settlement, do they ever leave the title open like they used to? So Sarah said, uh, "You can't leave the title open." So the answer is no to Bob's question. That was all. all right. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Next up is Sarah. She's she gets a double header this morning.
So I guess I can piggyback off of that a little bit, um, just in regards to the hold policy open. If you do have any cash deals and you want to hold that policy open and they go to refinance, they will get credit for the title insurance paid. So a lot of people do that. They buy in cash and then they wait and we can hold a policy open for a year. So if you buy now and they wait until next October, we can give them a credit for that title insurance paid, which can save them you know, hundreds of dollars at the end of the day. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention was now that we're officially in November, keep in mind all of the holidays that are coming up. People tend to forget about that just because life becomes so busy. And take that into consideration when you're scheduling your settlements um, or even getting mortgage, mortgage approval and clear to close. We have fewer business days between now and the end of the year. So anticipate that. Prep your, your buyers and sellers. Say paperwork needs to get in right away because we are losing business days. Veterans Day, Thanksgiving, people go on skeleton crews. Um, so just a reminder, keep on top of your clients to get all that paperwork turned in so that nothing gets delayed. Okay. That's all I got. All right. Thank you. Unless the boys want to jump on the back of mine in regards to the holidays. Next up is James White with insurance. Okay, okay. Uh, first of all, I'll be holding the bring your policy to work day. If you wanna bring it uh, next meeting day, whenever that happens to be, I'm gonna try and send out a reminder a couple of weeks before to get a head count in case I need more help as well too uh, with another person from my agency, but uh, just keep that in mind. I'll send an email out in, in a couple of weeks basically. Uh, so my quick topic that I had was, uh, something that I haven't ran into the past three, three and a half years I've been here. I had to quote, uh, what's called an earth home. And that's basically, um, the backside of the dwelling had earth three quarters of the way up on the siding, basically. So standard companies don't want to insure that basically. And I don't think you run into them very often here in Lancaster County, I know a couple other people at my agency have ran into some around the Harrisburg area, uh, but basically it's it's very high cost to insure. It was about $200 monthly um, with the similar coverage, coverage I normally quote, which is 500,000 in liability and a $1,000 deductible. So I'd say it was probably about at least two times to maybe triple the cost of what a typical standard house of that age it, with those coverages would be. So just keep that in mind. If you happen to run into one of those, it's going to be a lot more to insure basically. So. Okay. Thank you. For that. So much for going green, right? <laughs> Thank you, James. Um, we're going to start here. Uh, Bright has made a number of different changes to, when I say changes, enhancements, I guess I should say, to their, um, program. And this is one of them. right now, and I don't have it up here, but I wanted to make sure everybody is aware. And I've mentioned it at previous meetings. If you are a bright subscriber, which everyone in here should be other than our mortgage and title insurance people, uh, you get Inman news as a free benefit to being a subscriber to bright. If you don't know where that is, it's under one of your tabs under the market if you go in there, put in or click on the Inman News link, and all you have to do is just follow the uh, directions and you will have a free subscription to Inman News. They have now enhanced it even further with RIS Media, R-I-S Media. Um, that is also under the Market tab. It's also on the home page. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom on the right-hand side, it's actually on the home page. Normally, if you were somebody who was not a subscriber of Right, you would pay $250 a year for a subscription like this. With your Bright subscription, it is free. So I'm telling you now, if you just read Inman News and Risk, which we're going to talk a little bit about later today, you have paid for your Bright subscription virtually the entire year just by reading these subscriptions, Okay. Wanted to make sure everybody was aware it was there, it was something that was kicked off this past month. Uh, once again, it's on the homepage, Bright, it's all the way down at the bottom on the right-hand side. 
They update news stories having to do with real estate every single day. There's stuff about brokerage, about marketing agents. It's a lot of good information for you. So I wanted to make you aware that it's there. Next, everybody got an email, which I'm sure you read. The email was about this long. <clears throat> and about three quarters of the way through, I kind of scratched my head and said, so what does this mean to me? Uh, so if um, you know anything about something called multi-factor authentication, which I'm sure our mortgage people do uh, and our title people do because they are all about multi-factor authentication. It basically means that you're going to have to enter maybe two or three bits of information before you're going to be able to access dot loop. It is not a home sale thing. It is a dot loop thing. So this is not something that we kicked off. Although I will tell you, in the world in which we live in today, this is really, really important that we get in the habit of doing this over and over again. Um, I've started doing it on a couple of other programs that, that I have that I subscribe to. And, you know, once you do it after one or two times, you end up getting used to it. So I wanted to make you aware that is coming up. Um, uh, the email itself, you had to almost get to the end before you found out that it's not here yet. Okay. Um, RPR, for those of you that, that uh, use RPR, they have changed their home pages with uh, property data. This is a screenshot of their new property data screen. It's much easier to read. Uh, everything is located, well, I say everything, the vast majority of things are located right at the very top of the page. So if you haven't been on RPR in a while, I would encourage you to get on there, take a look at how they have kind of moved things around. There's a lot of really good things that RPR is doing. And once again, as, a, as an NAR uh, member, you get the uh, subscription to RPR for free, okay? <laughs> Um, so are we approaching a normalized market? We had, um, uh, James was, was uh, uh, kind enough to volunteer his time a couple of weeks ago um, on this, I think it was uh, four sessions having to do with a normalized market. We were dealing with mindset and sellers and buyers and a lot of different things to get prepared for this. So I wanna share some things that I pulled out of Bright that you can come to your own conclusions as to whether we are now dealing or approaching a normalized market, okay? Here are some quotes, first of all, that are coming from a uh, chief economist, the first American, his name is Mark Fleming. He says, while mortgage rates are expected to continue to drift higher over the coming months, much of the rapid increase in rates is likely behind us. Nationally, while month over month house prices may decline, annual house price declines are not expected given the ongoing supply, demand, imbalance, and continued strength in the labor market. Keep in mind, he's a national economist. In a second here, we're gonna deal with Lancaster County and what's actually happening in Lancaster County with prices, uh, which is a little different than what is going on on a national basis. He goes on to say, while the markets considered overvalued may need to adjust to the not so new reality of higher mortgage rates, housing market fundamentals still support a moderation of annualized house, appreci house price appreciation rather than a sharp decline. If you are reading all the stuff in the media, everybody is saying that prices are going down, 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 down. Not so in Lancaster County. Um, and it's been that way for a number of months. So I'm going to show you some other things about Lancaster County versus some of the surrounding counties that uh, are around us and how we are faring based upon the numbers versus what they are doing. So here's the first one. Average days on the market over the last four months. Average days on the market over the last four months. In June, it was at 13. September, and I haven't pulled them for October yet, uh, we are at 20. It is gradually rising. It is gradually rising. These are all Lancaster County numbers. Now, a lot of you who are brand new in the business, you're panicking going, oh my God, 20 days on the market, that's forever. <laughs> 
Uh, trust me, that's still really, really, really fast. Um, but it's not 13, it's 20. So an additional week has been tapped on over the last three or four months. So you can see the upward trend. And I would suspect once I get the October numbers, that's probably going to go up a little bit again also. Here's our average sale price. Uh, in June, it was 332. In September, we're at 336. We are holding steady in Lancaster County, unlike what you are reading in the national media, where they are saying things are depreciating. So we are holding steady, and we're doing a fairly good job. And once again, this will bear out with some things uh, once I get uh, to a couple of other slides here you're gonna understand that it's kind of interesting to be in Lancaster County right now. We're kind of an island based upon what's happening around us for a lot of good reasons. So we are doing fairly well average sale price. And by the way, you look at that and it looks steady. What the national press isn't telling you is what has happened since September of last year. So this is one year Things have gone from 300 to 336. That's an increase of 12%. Okay. So that is a really good sign. Once again, that's still historically, that's a huge number. That's a huge number for a jump from uh, year over year. Here's the sale price to original price ratio. As of May, to put a property on the market, on average, you were getting 105.5% of the list price. Look at what has happened over the last four or five months. Things have gone down. Once again, we look at this and we say, God, we're down to 100%. Trust me, historically, it's been in the 90s somewhere. Okay. So we're still seeing properties move really, really fast, really fast. Um, Who's who's had some um, uh, transactions where they've been in multiple offer situations lately? Okay, how many homes or how many uh, transactions? Um, I'm not saying this well. How many agreements were there, Carol? Three. There were three, three, Julie, yeah. three to four, four, four and one, five. Okay, so Julie said there was an investor special and there was 22. For those of, on, for those of you on Zoom, I kind of polled four or five people in the audience here and they're all saying about three, four, or five, which once again, historically, that is still a really, really busy market. We're just coming off of a market where we're used to 20 and 30 agreements that were all being uh, issued at the same time. So we're still in a really good market as far as buyers are concerned. And I know I've talked to a couple of you in the office starting to get FHA and VA transactions approved and actually accepted, okay? Which was unheard of over the last 12 to 18 months. So for those of you that are dealing with FHA and VA buyers and thinking ah, it's a lost cause, just think again. Think again. Yeah, James. Just had a USDA with DHS at close. Okay. James said he had a USDA with PHFA close. Um, were you competing with anybody? Uh, I think there was one other offer. He said there was one other offer. Uh, but once again, we're now dealing with other types of financing that is getting approved. Um, or getting accepted versus once again, 12 months ago, if you sat down with a VA or an FHA buyer uh, for the first time and you're sitting in a conference room and they say, I have this amount of money and you just, your head, your forehead hits the table going, oh God, this is going to be a long, long haul. Well, I think we're getting to the point that a lot of those people can start re-entering the marketplace again. Okay. Um, the home demand index. Um, I covered this about three meetings ago, I believe. This is also in your Bright subscription. Uh, Bright partnered with a company called T360, and basically what they do 
is they look at the marketplace and you talk about artificial intelligence here. This is unbelievable what they do. They're taking showing time and the amount of showings that are occurring on properties. They're taking a look at um, they're taking a look at sites like Realtor.com, uh, the the uh, Home Snap, and they're seeing how many hits are on each property. They're taking like five or six things and they're putting it into a pot and kind of mixing it all together. And they're saying, based upon what we see, here's how active the market is right now. Okay, so it's a pretty neat thing. So, and by the way, this is going to be really small, so I'll try to describe this to you. Here's the map of central PA. Uh, I think you recognize at least the outline of Lancaster PA. Okay. That orange represents, and there's a little thing at the bottom, that orange represents a really high, fast moving market. Now look at all the counties around us. Blue, by the way, is in the dump. So we're kind of an island out there at least in central PA. Um, the rating that we have is 143. Anything that's about 100 is considered really a good, a good market. So we're at 143, we're blowing it out of the water. You go across the river to York, they're in 92. So just from one county to another, totally different. We've all heard the adage, real estate is local. This kind of proves it out. So we're in a really good position here in Lancaster County with how fast the market is and how healthy the market is at this point in time. Okay. Um, by the way, when I say in the dumps, I'm out here to Fulton County, 31. So if you're a real estate agent in Fulton County, you got some issues going on right now. Okay. So what this also does, you can actually click on Lancaster County and get every municipality and what the home demand index is there. Once again, orange is a hot, hot market. Blue is in the dumps. You see a trend? Okay. So, I know, I know Colleen's on the call and I pointed out this the last time. She's down in Quarryville in the blue area. Um, they're doing a good job down in Quarryville, but as you can see, we are kind of smack dab in the middle of the bright orange. When I say we, North Point. So we're in a really, really good area at this point in time. And once again, they take each one of these and they're all zip codes and they put them over here on the right-hand side and they will rate each one, okay? So right now, if you look at the, uh, the index for uh, some of the zip codes, 17508 Brownstown, once again, keep in mind 100 is fast moving. Brownstown is at 398. I mean, it's off the charts. So I would encourage you, when you're starting to work with buyers and sellers, sellers especially, if you're taking a listing in any of these areas, I would pull this map and I'd show the sellers what's happening in their specific area, especially if somebody says, well, I understand the market's still really hot in Lancaster County and you're trying to take a listing right there. I would say to them, listen, here's what's happening in your specific zip code here. We gotta be very, very competitive. Okay, so even in different parts of Lancaster County, things are different, okay? So once again, this is the Home Demand Index. If you go to your Bright uh, homepage, it's under the Market tab, and there's, a, there's a, a link there called Home Demand Index. Once again, we get lumped in with Philadelphia, but the, law, or the further you drill into it, you can get into Central Pennsylvania and then specifically into Lancaster County, okay? So I had the opportunity, as did Donna, um, to listen to this woman uh, last weekend. Her name is Casey Blade Cunningham. Uh, she is the founder and CEO of, I'm gonna screw this up, Zenix. Yes, 
And um, I believe Dan and James heard her also, what, a month ago or so? Did you hear her? Throughout time, yeah. yeah. Okay. We got a lot of that stuff. Okay. So very interesting lady. And, uh, you know, Donna was at this event along with me. What did you think of her, Donna? Yeah, she has a really interesting background, really interesting background, which I'm going to play a little video here that that is, is going to show uh, some of her background. But um, I'll, I'll talk about what she said to us as a group coming up here because it relates to the main topic that, that I'll end up talking about. So this is Casey and her story. I was born and raised with uh, two Puerto Rican parents. I had one of the most amazing childhoods you can imagine. If you've ever seen Lucy and Ricky Ricardo and I Love Lucy, that was my family. My mother, who struggled financially because my father passed away. My mother, who was widowed as a school teacher with five children, she had the kids captivated and they wanted so much to listen and to learn and to lean in to her life. All I say is, I don't care what you do, be the best in life. I don't, if you were a trash collector, be the best. I don't care what. She was just magical. And so I want to be just like her. I want to make a difference in people's lives. And so um, I started to pursue sales and entered into an incredible industry um, where I could actually help people achieve the American dream. When my husband and I were building Xenix, we wanted a name for the company to have something that had meaning. And by accident, we um, were speaking to someone and they asked us one question. What's the one thing you want people to say about you and your company? And we both said, well, that's easy. Excellence, integrity, quality, service. The lady literally said, what you just said begins and ends with excellence. I see X's. She said, I don't know what we're gonna put on the inside, and I'm like, oh, that's easy, because my mom, from the time I was a little girl, told me that through excellence, there are infinite possibilities. And she looked at me and she said, okay, I in. Through excellence, there are infinite possibilities. And so that's the origin of the Zenix name. We created an entirely new industry that didn't really exist to the standards and expectations that we had for ourselves. Oftentimes in the business world, we get going so fast and so furious and we're always in a hurry. People see that they don't want to stop and sharpen the saw and take the time that's necessary to help them achieve the results that they really want to achieve. The unique thing about Xenix is that we come along individuals once we've helped them articulate and identify their specific goals and then do whatever it takes to hold them accountable to reaching those goals and beyond. The Zenix system is about training, accountability, and coaching. So you're going to train someone and ensure that they get exactly what they need where they are in their business today. Because ultimately, it's not just about training. It's about training and accountability. If we can teach them the fundamentals of success and how to be better at who they are and what they do every day, then we have won and we have accomplished our mission. What makes Zenix special are the people that work there and they have a mission to help other people. And it is so clear and so vibrant and so much fun. You know, we've won over 15 culture awards as a result of a team coming together and serving one another first, then their community, and then our customers. I remember being a kid and the advice my mother would give me again and again, and it was to be your very best. So at Zenix, we energize people and elevate results. We will not stop until we help them achieve what they want, and that is to give them the, the life that they've chosen and that they have a dream for. Can you hold on one second?
Well, it was interesting. Before she started the company, she was a very successful, was it a real estate agent or a mortgage lender? A mortgage lender. Mortgage lender. And she said that her her boss came to her one day and said, because she wasn't, she was very, very good at what she did, but she wasn't very, very liked. And her boss came to her and said, you are going to come to the meeting this week and you're going to tell everybody what you do because everybody wants to know why you're so successful. And she said, no, I'm not. And he said, yes, you are. And she said, no, I'm not. And she said that went back and forth for a little bit. And he said, you're going to come and you're going to tell everybody. And she came to the meeting and she said she had one woman in her company that she was not liked by and nor did she care for her. And she said after that meeting, that woman came up to her and hugged her and said, thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. So after that, that's when she realized that she needed to do more and give back and started that company. Yeah, it was, um, it, it was an, it was an interesting, um, an interesting, that's okay. I used to have a mic. Okay. That's okay. You can put it, here. Um, it was an interesting session that we had because not only did you hear the story about her childhood and how she started the company and uh, how she grew into who she is today, uh, but she, she shared a lot of different things with us. Uh, we actually had some exercises uh, at the end of uh, her session, but what her whole session was about was something called three powerful words for success and everything revolved around this and she said whether you're working on trying to improve your family life your diet exercise attitude kids work success income spouse house car relationships your brain she said it all boils down to three words i am responsible Stop blaming other people. Stop blaming the conditions that you're in. You are where you are. Now make the best of it. And that's what she got from her mom. And then ultimately she lives on a day-to-day -day basis now. And that's part of what, where I'm going with this next part, which you saw in the beginning of this, we're in that normalizing market. Some of us are saying, God, things have really slowed down. But when you look at us versus surrounding counties, we're in a much better position than a lot of people that are surrounding us. And it's going to get more normalized, more than likely. Okay. We have to make the best of the circumstances that are put in front of us. So I'm going to share with you some things. Changing markets belong to people who are prepared. Okay, so we haven't really felt it yet, but we probably will over the next couple of months, things will slow down a little bit more. And a lot of people, because we're dealing with Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's, some people are gonna just mail it in and say, holidays are coming up, I'm just gonna mail it in, I'll wait till 2023 gets here. By the way, if you mail it in now, beginning of 2023 is not going to look really pretty. So once again, look at some of these things and see if you can take some things from this about how to approach going forward in this normalizing market. In market corrections, which I believe this is a correction. This is not a depression. This is not a recession in the real estate market. This is a correction at this point in time. Market corrections are not bad things. Fear creeps in because we have to adapt and change the way we've been doing business. We're not going to be able to put properties on the market and they just automatically sell themselves. We're going to have to do some things that we haven't done probably in, in quite some time. And for those of you that are newer in the business, you've never seen some of the things that we're going to talk about here. Uh, if you understand the market, you can be prepared to switch gears before your competitors. Now, the, the nice thing about being uh, Mr. Rose in my age is that we've seen all of this virtually. Uh, so this doesn't phase us because we've gone through a lot of these different things. Bless you. 
I know, and I've said it in the past, when I first got into the business, speaking of being in the present of, of what you're doing right then and there, when I got into the business, the interest rates were 16 and 17%. And I'm thinking to myself, I had no idea what the difference was. So I just sold in that environment. If I would have listened to all the people that were surrounding me, they would have said, why are you getting into the business right now? I asked myself that question now. Why are you getting into the business now? Don't you know it's a bad time? I didn't know any better. Bob didn't know any better. Bob and I, we were too, <laughs> we, we just did what we did. Uh, we got through it. We had a different attitude than a lot of people. Okay. So understand this is a market correction a market correction. So things that happen in a seller's market, and by the way, we have been in a seller's market. Do any of these things sound familiar? Sellers think their house is worth more than what it actually is. I can't tell you how many times I've had people in this office come to me 12 months ago and say, I did a CMA and it comes in at 300,000 and I got an offer at 425. I have no idea. I have no idea where that came from. And Dan's in the back of the room laughing, saying he's, you know, Dan saw all these appraisals and, and different things that were happening in the finance industry. We just had no concept of what was going on. Uh, you don't, they don't see value in agents because basically all you did as an agent outside looking in is you went to their house on a Friday night, you put a sign in the yard on Friday night when you left, and Saturday you had 15 offers. And that's what they thought you did. Put a sign in the yard and that was it, okay? It's harder for agents to take listings because it was very, very competitive and obviously we had a very low inventory market. There was pressure to cut commissions and the inventory is low. So that is a seller's market. Some of you have never seen a buyer's market. This is what a buyer's market looks like. It's the exact opposite. Buyers want rock bottom pricing. Where do you go and show your 50th home to a buyer who wants to lowball everything that you show them? Now you could get away with that or you couldn't get away with that in the market that we just went through because they'd never get anything. But in markets like this, a buyer's market, Things are going to be listed at 300 and your buyer is going to say, I'd like to, I'd like to start here at 250. And that's what a buyer's market is. They want to look at everything. You think you showed a lot of properties in a seller's market? What do you have a buyer that wants to look from the northern edge of Reading, Berks County, all the way down to Quarryville and everything in between? See it three times. And three times. <laughs> and the second and the second time they go, Bob said they want to see it three times. And the second time they go, they want to bring mom and dad. Okay. And then the third time they go, they have their next door neighbors and everybody else going through. Uh, there's no pressure to choose a house quickly. So many of you in this uh, in the market that we've just gone through have said to your buyers, and I've heard you say it because I've actually coached you to do some of this stuff. Um, have heard uh, you talking to your buyer saying, listen, I know we just saw this property. There's 17 other business cards on the counter. If we don't make an offer on this tonight, it's going to be gone tomorrow. And I've heard you say that. And by the way, that was a true statement. In a buyer's market, you're, there's no cards in the kitchen counter. Uh, and your buyers see that too. So they're saying, well, let me go home and think about it. And then they think about it. And then they call you up the next day and said, well, we're not quite sure. Can we go look at some more homes? And three weeks later, that home is still there. Um, pressure on agents to negotiate. Uh, we have really had to back off. When I say negotiate, we negotiated hard in a different way in the market that we just came through. But in something like this, where it's a buyer's market, it's a whole ball of wax how, uh, different how you negotiate because now you're trying to get the lowest price versus what we just went through. And sellers want more, more, more marketing. And whatever you do, 
in A&M. Okay? And they're going to call you. I've only had three showings in the first month, which, by the way, isn't that bad. I've only had three showings in the first month. You know, what are you doing to get my, I, you haven't sold, you haven't shown my property yet. How come you haven't shown my property yet? What do you start getting that? Okay. These are different objections that you have never heard in the market that we were just in. Okay. So you're going to have to learn how to do that. And then there's the agent's market. It's right in the middle. Okay. This is where everything is hunky-dory and it's peachy keen. And this is the market that we love. And out of my 37, 38 years in the business, I've experienced maybe two of these. For a week. For a week, exactly. <laughs> so homes are selling at a fair market value. Sellers, rec or, excuse me, sellers recognize value in using an agent. You don't get as many objections about commissions and what you do. Buyers are more reasonable and there's less pressure all around. Uh, because things are moving at a normal pace, okay? So these are the, the three different types of markets, the buyer's market, the seller's market, and that kind of equilibrium right in the middle. So how do we deal with all these? Number one, as we go into this normalizing market, keep an open mind. Keep an open mind for new, different ways of doing things. Limiting belief systems need a makeover. Once again, when I got in the business, the 16, 17% interest rates, I didn't even have a limiting belief because I didn't even know what that meant, okay? I just went out and sold real estate. You have to have the same kind of mentality, okay? Focus on why we can do something versus why we can't. Why you can versus why you can't. Number two, be flexible. You got to change quickly. Some of the things you've been using over the last six months, you will you will not use again for another five to ten years, literally. So you've got to be flexible in how in how you're approaching buyers and sellers. Learn new stuff by expanding your knowledge base. We're going to talk more about this at the end. <clears throat> um, some of us have gotten really lax in understanding some of the things that are available to us, either through the company or as an industry. We have, to, we have to kind of back up now and we need to put, I call them more bullets in our holster because we need to get better at what we've been doing. <clears throat> Number three, stay up to date on trends. I just mentioned Inman News. I just mentioned Risk Media. These are news outlets that are specific to the real estate industry. I'm telling you, every day, you ought to read the first couple headlines in each one of those subscriptions that you have for free. Understand what's happening in other parts of the country. Understand what's happening marketing-wise. Understand what's happening with new trends. I guarantee you there are going to be some very interesting trends <clears throat> that we're going to see over the next couple of months that we're going to look at and say, I've never seen that before. And if you read some of these articles, you'll learn about it first. Not only that, but you can start talking with buyers and sellers more intelligently if you know what's going on in the marketplace, okay? Number four, be willing to learn from others. Uh, join a mastermind group. Um, follow, watch, and listen to expert agents and brokers. In the world in which we live in today, we have podcasts out the gazoo. You can hop on YouTube today and just type in real estate and you'll get a thousand different real estate agents from across the country giving you ideas. That's what you've got to do, okay? And number five, know what's in your holster. So I'm going to cover some things that you may know exist, but because of what we've gone through, you're like, ah, I don't need to know this stuff. It's not really relevant to the market that we're in. So I have two screenshots up there. These are from the Berkshire Hathaway Resource Center. And some people, it's been months since you've been on the Resource Center. Some people are in there every other day, but you don't utilize everything that's in there. 
The top screenshot, um, this is the marketing tab. There are various things available to you in the marketing tab. And keep in mind, we haven't had to do too much of this with a seller lately. But trust me, when the property is on the market for 30 or 60 days, uh, going back to one of my previous lines here, the seller is going to be looking at you saying, what you're doing isn't enough. What are you doing? Are you giving me more? What are you doing? Okay. Get into that tab and you'll see a lot of different things that you can do for a seller and a buyer for that matter. Um, if it's been a while since you've been in the Learn Center in the Berkshire Hathaway um, franchise website, they have totally revised this. There's some unbelievable stuff in here. Interviews and things from across the country from other franchisees where they're interviewing agents and brokers and teams and things that you can pick up on. I was in there last night. Um, to be perfectly frank, it's been probably about three months since I've been in there. And I opened it up and I was just shocked at all the stuff that was in there. So if it's been a while or you've never been in there, just get in there and start browsing around. You're going to learn a lot of stuff. Okay, That's called the Learn Center. And then there's things that we have here at Home Sale that you've looked at maybe in the past and say, I don't need that. I don't need that because things are moving so fast. Um, people, I, I've heard it from agents. Um, agents have said, why did you roll out quick buy in this market that we're in where things sell in the span of 24 hours? Well, guess what? I think you're going to have more reason to use quick buy coming up. If it's been a while since you were, it was introduced to you maybe nine months ago, I would reacquaint myself with this because in a changing market, there's going to be more and more people that are going to say, I want a quick sale, something like what occurred nine months ago. And it's not going to happen. And you can offer quick buy as an alternative, but you can't if you don't know what it's about. Okay. Close, which is our CRM. Um, I, I was interested, I was talking to Bob this morning. Bob and I are working on a, a, a difficult transaction. I'll just leave it at that. A difficult transaction. And during the course of the transaction, Bob was texting both buyers and sellers and an attorney. And he talked to me this morning. He said, does Close really put all your text messages under this person? I said, yes, it does. So all your text messages go into a file in close under a transaction under a person's name. And, and as Bob said, now I don't want to put words in his mouth. He said, boy, this would have been really nice at the very beginning if I had uh, used close in that regard. There are certain things about close that will just blow you away if you get in there, but you have to know how to use it. Have to know how to use it. Uh, Chalk Digital, Market Watch Reports. Uh, we just talked about RPR a couple of minutes ago. Social Connector, uh, VIP Services. What can you offer to buyers and sellers that sets you apart from the competition? And Payload Key Box. I'm still amazed at the amount of agents, not in this office, but otherwise, that are saying, I didn't know that existed. And what is payload key box? And it's now been around for almost two years. Okay. It's a way to get deposits into our system virtually instantaneously. What's the, I'm, Go ahead. I'm having challenges getting buyers to use it. Right? Say, again. Say it again. I'm curious as to like how many people are taking advantage of it and how many are not, like okay. the percentage. Okay. And how do I sell? So that was Carol saying buyers are giving her some pushback, okay? Buyers are giving her some pushback. Okay, so let's do things the old-fashioned way. Let's do them on paper, right? Okay, so the alternative to doing this is to physically write out a check. And who's that check going to? The other agency. So who are you giving it to? You're giving it to your agent. Berkshire Hathaway agent. And then that agent delivers it to XYZ company. And who are you giving it to? Listing agent. Does the buyer know who the listing agent is? If you're handing over a check to somebody you have no idea who it is. 
And then that person gives it to an accountant in another company. <laughs> Whoops. Um, my point is that the same type of objections occurred when we started using digital signatures, exact same. And we all know, and once again, I'll get back to Bob. Bob and I are dealing with a, a situation right now where we had to document when somebody read, when somebody read and opened up the, um, the, the document that we sent them. Because hard to believe someone lied. Imagine that, okay? And because we have it in a digital version, we can now track this stuff. The same thing applies here. Is It's almost exactly the same objections you're getting to using payload keybox as what you were doing with, you know, is that digital signature really good? And how do I know the person signed it? And we're all kind of looking at that today saying, gosh, what is... What took us so long to get here? Okay. What took us so long to get here? Is there any other offices using that for us? There's a number of other offices. Um, the, the question was, is there any other offices that are using this other than us? Um, Remax is using it. Virtually all the Remax offices are using. It. And when I say either this or a version of this, they come under different names. Uh, Keller Williams is using it. Uh, Cobalt Banker is using it. They're all using it. Yeah. Um, but once again, yeah, once again, it, it, it's a ten dollar fee to use it. But the convenience of it is. And by the way, anybody in here lose a transaction during this last eighteen months because somebody failed to come up with a deposit? I dealt with it dozens of times in this office where somebody keeps it for five days, which is what it says in the agreement of sale. Let me turn it over in five days. And on the fifth day, the buyer says, well, I saw another property I'd like to get involved with where I don't want to go in this direction. And then now the seller wants to sue, but there's nothing to fall back on. So now you've lost some time. The seller gets upset at you. If you use payload key box and put one day in there, it goes in essentially when the agreement of sale is signed. And you don't have the you don't have those issues. Okay. I don't want to spend all kinds of time on this, but there are other things that I can share with you that that can ease that uh, ease a, a buyer's mind of utilizing that system. Okay. And we'll end with this. I thought this was really, really appropriate for the market that we're in right now. This is Wayne Gretzky. Um, I will tell you, I know that much about hockey, that much. But when I saw this guy play, all you had to do was watch him for five minutes and you're like, that guy's special. He's different than everybody else that's out there running around on, or skating around on skates. He's different. And his famous saying is, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has already been. This whole segment that we've been talking about is, we may not know, you know, we know where we've been. We're going to be going someplace else. Let's get prepared and get in front of it to be in that spot, to get to intercept that puck. Once again, I knew nothing about this. And for those of you that aren't hockey fans, I know Bob's a big hockey fan. He's the great one. The great one. Um, he was something to look at. He was just, and by the way, if you looked at the guy, he was like this tall. He was skinny. You know, he looked, he had, even when he was 30, he looked like he was 12. But he was so much better than everybody else. Okay. That's what we have to do. So everybody have a great day. Enjoy the normalizing market.